Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show dedicated to sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada. Our goal is to learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. My name is Christopher Brown, and I will be your host for this exciting journey. This episode of the Cross Border Interviews was recorded at the Cochrane, Alberta Town Office. Today's guest is none other than Cochrane Mayor Jeff Janun. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Ooh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, right. What a hard hitting question right off the bat. Right off the bat. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. It's, um, I think a person who runs for office has to be wired a certain way. So obviously I'm, I've got that wiring intact. I think that's uh, somewhat genetic. Um, but on a personal note, I grew up in, a, in this community of Cochrane, uh, moved here in 1976 in grade two. Um, Cochrane was a much different place then, 1,200 people. Um, you could literally walk to school across the highway here in when I was in grade three, and my mom would watch from the, the porch, and <laughs> off I'd go and, and feel safe doing so. Um, Cochrane remains a, a safe community, but traffic is different. The population is 35,000. Uh, but in those years growing up here, I I worked for the local IGA store in in high school, and the, my boss then, the owner of the the grocery store, was the mayor of Cochrane. So it was kind of my first glimpse, I guess, into what a mayor uh, was and who he was and what he did. Uh, he was a, an excellent boss, very hard uh, working. Um, asked a lot of employees but was fair and, and honest and um, had me do a few things for him to help him out in his mayoral role which you know drive his truck in the parade those yeah. types of things um, so I kind of got to see I guess for the first time what that that someone if you you wanted to be could be mayor of your community um, years later I was in construction and doing the typical coffee break with uh, all the trades around, uh, sitting around having a coffee, and I was complaining about the town. And <laughs> this, uh, I, I probably was doing that more often than I realized, but uh, one of my buddies at the time said, hey, like, why don't you stop complaining about this and run for office? So I'm like, okay, I will. And so I ran, and um, this was 2001, and I, I won. I was a counselor. I was 30 some year, 31, I think. And uh, my eyes were, were opened. I learned a, a lot about what it is to serve your community and um, was starting to make changes uh, with a group and, and really felt um, that this was what I was meant to do. So there's a lot to unpack there. I <laughs> yeah. want to start with this, though. You made a conscious choice to choose municipal politics. Mm -hmm. You could have given back and helped out your community in many different ways, whether it be volunteerism, through nonprofits, uh, through federal politics, through provincial politics, or even through school board. But you chose, at the end of the day, municipal politics. One of the big questions that we try to get to is why municipally? What was it about the draw and about the uh, aura of municipal politics that you said Jeff would be best served and best serving his community mm -hmm. in the municipal realm. I think um, probably I was naive to <laughs> to well, well where Truthfully? I could make a yeah well where I could make a difference, but it felt achievable. It felt like I could walk off the street in whatever job role I was in and run for council. Um, so there was that mystique about it, but then also I think we're the closest government to the people, and to make changes in on the streets in your community, what better way to, to get involved than right in the right in the municipal world. So I think that was that had, was the reason. Had municipal politics being discussed in the household growing up? Was your mom no. and dad involved no. municipally or politically or are no. you the black sheep of a family? I'm black sheep, but I'm finding as uh, the more I'm involved in politics, the the more I see the interest in my family. And I don't know if it's from following their son. Um, already kind of wired that way. Um, I had no idea, though, growing up that they were that way. Okay. So you decided to put your name forward in the first election, and correct me if I'm wrong here, 2001, you said? Yes. 2001. What were the issues of the time? You talk <laughs> about the, I know this is going back almost 20 years ago, 22 years yes. ago from recording. Um, we talk about 
in more recent elections about pandemics, about healthcare, about education, the macro issues that yeah. face municipalities. Going back to that first election, what were you hearing at the doorsteps, and do you still remember those that first campaign? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I actually, I think so. Just to, to kind of close the loop on that, I, I was a councillor for two terms. They were three-year terms back then. Yep. So I I was um, on council from two thousand one to seven. And I took a 10-year break, okay. raised my family, worked on my local business, and then decided to, to run for mayor in 2017. So obviously successful. I'm in my second term. But the, the benefit of hindsight and really uh, having issues that we dealt with 20 years ago or decisions we made and then seeing now at the other end at, at times the impacts or how they've been um, contemplated through and, and I guess extrapolated through time, uh, it's interesting. Um, one of the issues at the time was um, right down in downtown Cochrane was a, a huge Domtar um, creosote plant um, that had been since um, Domtar had moved away, left a contaminated site, and we had 50 acres in the heart of our community with a big black tarp over it and fenced, and they were doing their industrial um, duty of keeping the weeds down and paying minimal taxes, and, and that was it. So one of the issues was get that, that land developed. Today, it's home of Garmin Canada. It's got uh, Canadian Tire, a Save on Foods, a Safeway, a Shoppers Drug Mart, a housing. It's turned into a vibrant um, anchor in our in our downtown and it really in our community we've and at that time people were worried about walmart coming to cochran and ruining our downtown and destroying the the elements that uh is nimbyism alive here oh yeah <laughs> alive and well <laughs> really? alive and well yeah I, it's um well it's it's change it's it's less nimbyism as it is i think people are are hesitant to change okay. uh, but that is one thing cochran has going on uh Things are changing here at a rapid rate. The fastest growing community in all of Alberta. We've been top 10 in Canada for years. Um, I was driving in today and I yeah. saw all the construction that was going on and not even construction, but building as well, mm -hmm. like of residential areas. Going back to that 2001, you've seen this town grow. You've seen oh, this yeah. community yeah. change on a pretty substantial base. How does it make you feel? How does that make you feel as a municipal councillor and as the now as mayor to be able to say the decisions we made in 2001 to 2007 when you were on council have made the town the way it is right now? Yeah, I, I feel blessed, um, lucky to live in a place that other people want to live in. It's uh, it's cool to have. I mean, the growth is a is a challenge, but it's a good problem to have. Um, if we were shrinking and trying to attract business or residents even, that's a completely different problem. We don't have that problem. We have the, the luxury of uh, leveraging our desirability, is the language I've been using, of people want to be here. Well, let's make sure it's the Cochrane that we want and the Cochrane that uh, we're going to get in the future is also the one that we want. And the um, growth, when people push back and say, okay, I'm here no more growth, um, which I hear often. Um, I start to put it in terms of um, you as a person. So does growth to you mean um, like where are your kids gonna, gonna live someday? Do you, do you want them to have the option to maybe buy a house or a home and have a job in Cochrane? The answer is always yes. Well, that's growth. Um, where maybe your, your aging parents want to move closer to their grandkids. Do you want them to have the option to buy a home and live in Cochrane, closer to you and your family? Yes, that's growth. So managing, leveraging our desirability and having an outcome that we're, we're in control of is, is the destiny that I, I see for our community. So I'm already fascinated by this conversation. This has <laughs> taken a complete turn from what I, where I was going to go at the beginning. But I want to stick on what you just said there. You as mayor, you as council have to balance the needs of the individual with the needs of the community. Yes. You have to be there to look after what the community is going to grow into without forgetting about the people who've elected you but also put you into this position. How do you do that? Because I can imagine it's challenging because you probably talk to many people on the street and many people in your day-to-day -day, uh, job and they all have different needs and wants. Mm -hmm. 
and you as council have to pick the winners and losers at the end of the day of who's going to get their issues yep. addressed and who's not going to get them addressed. Totally. How do you do that? Uh, well, <laughs> I've, <laughs> I've got big ears. I think um, whenever I'm, I really enjoy going to the grade six classes in the, the elementary schools where they're taking municipal government. Um, and I give speeches on, and they're always asking, what's the, the most important thing you need to do or be if you're the mayor? And it's listen. Listen to people. Um, people need to feel heard, uh, listened to, and then it's my job to, and councils, to weigh everything that we hear and then chart up the best path forward. Uh, we're not, as you say, we're not going to um, please everybody, um, but we need to please most of the people. So the way we're managing the growth question is how is new growth going to improve the current quality of life and standard of living for Cochranites now? It might be a new um, amenity. It might be a connection and a roadway that we've been hoping for. Um, so we're going to ask developers and new, new neighborhoods to bring those to the table to enhance our quality of life for Cochrane. So growth will, while it brings its challenges and we're going to need another rec center and another seniors uh, center and home um, all of those things they're all on the list and we're we're checking them off slowly um, but growth is bringing the improvements to our community at the same time you talk about the pace mm. that it's slow it's not a quick turn that flick of a switch and everything's changed you have to grow the city make it vibrant, make it sustainable, but you know, and as much as I know, that government does not move as fast as everything else wants to. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance that need of trying to grow your community in a sustainable way, but understanding that there's limitations of growth because you can't just tomorrow plan for a pool or a rec, or a rec center or a senior's facility because that costs money. And yeah. There's not a lot of money around right now. So how do you balance the growth aspect with the time aspect because you are growing mm -hmm. and I've, I see it, saw it firsthand as I was driving into your community today. I, I can imagine there is a point where you can't grow any more out because you only have a certain amount of boundaries. So what's next? Yeah, um, there's a lot of in that question. Um, and, and I yeah. apologize for going no. this way because I, I wanted to start to talk about you, but you seem like someone who's so engaged in their community and understands the wants and needs of your community. I find this conversation more fascinating than me asking you, so how did it feel about being on the ballot the first time? <laughs> <laughs> Which I ask people, and I yeah. find that interesting, but you seem to want to engage. No, I'm, I'm happy to, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, uh, to be honest, I think when people, if, if we're communicating properly with our, our residents, which is a challenge, um, well, I what? mean, yeah, <laughs> a lot of people, I think, um, and I was one of those, you, you're not elected, you have a general interest in your community and how things are going and taxes and streets are clean and garbage gets picked up so you're generally happy in your day-to-day -day and you go about your life you're taking your kids to hockey you're involved in your sports or your activities as an adult and you, your friends and you, you maybe you complain or you talk about politics or who might be running in the re, in the local election but you really don't get involved and i think Is that, that it, uh we had about 40 percent voter turnout so yes ish engagement are two different things right? yes so um well it turns out it's great 40 percent is hilariously yeah. <laughs> great to yeah, me. that seems amazing i'm but, saddened that that's great <laughs> <laughs> true that but engagement when you go ask for opinions will people give it to you well it, it it's interesting you ask that because we're we're on that path right now especially post covid um and this is a we've been t having this conversation a lot around here it's how do we get people like a real cross-section of our community to speak up about x doesn't matter transit uh homelessness uh seniors housing whatever the issue uh, how do we get a, a, a good cross-section of our community involved um, since COVID, it's been extreme uh, views are loud um, they found a platform there we've had protesters we've had um, different delegations at council asking for different things that are at times um, extreme um, and I think again my personal opinion the 
the general public is just kind of sitting back going, I don't want to get involved in that. I don't want the, on social media, I don't want to be shamed. I don't feel safe in, in sharing my views. I don't, I just don't want to get involved. It's easier to sit back. So we're really, uh, the language I've been using is we're really trying to be challenged with waking up our community to, um, to get involved in, in the future of Cochrane. And it's, uh, I'm optimistic. I think we'll, we'll find a way. I'm happy to do interviews like this. And anytime I can talk about what we're up to, um, it's great. But generally, when I sit down with even some of those extreme view um, people, uh, when I sit down across the table from them and have a conversation and they ask questions about things, they're generally, oh, I, I didn't realize that. I, I had had that wrong. And I can, once they kind of understand what we're up to and what we're working on, uh, people are generally supportive. How much respect comes into, how much does respect come into play? Because you may be opposed to many different viewpoints that you hear on a regular t uh, basis when you're in front of, uh, when people are in front of you at council, but you have to give them the respect because you're the mayor and yep. they're the people who are in your community. How much does respect come into play in your job? Um, or lack of? There's, well, I'm going to flip that question yeah. a little bit later, but for you, how much do you give respect to people, even even if you disagree with them fundamentally, mm -hmm. you still take will take the time to listen to them, hear yep. them out, hear their concerns, you bet. and respect them enough to be able to say, you, I, I, I agree you, or I disagree. I understand you, or I agree with you, yep. I disagree with you. Does respect come into play on a regular basis in your job? Yes. Um, First of all, it's respect for this position that I hold. I have the utmost respect for the position of mayor, council, anyone um, who wants or can or puts their name forward to even be on a ballot, like you said at the beginning. Um, utmost respect for those individuals. Um, it's a difficult job. I had no idea what I was getting into. Um, sometimes I look in the mirror and ask, why am I still doing this? Um, but I, I love my community and I love this job. But of late, it has been very difficult. Um, the challenges from COVID, the, the things we just chatted about. But the, the respect thing is important because um, for me personally, respecting the position, I, I respect how I present myself because I have respect for the, the trust that people have uh, put in me to be in this position to represent our community, whether that be in front of you today, in front of your, your viewers or listeners. Um, I am, I am Cochrane's mayor first and Jeff second. And that is because I respect uh, and will only ever um, put Cochrane's best face forward on their behalf. Because I, I respect the hell out of this, this position in this office. And like it is a- days you just want to be Jeff though? Is there <laughs> days that, like, I can imagine you going to the grocery store and taking two hours to go get a jug of milk is probably not the best thing that you'd be spending your time with and you want to just be Jeff husband, father, X, Y, Z, is there days where that gets to you and the personal side of politics, especially local politics, because you're not in Edmonton, you're not yeah. the one doing your job. No, it's funny that this has transformed into this type of interview. Uh, and this, These are the interviews no, that I do. <laughs> no, but the, the, it, this is real. Um, it, you're, you're bang on. Uh, it, it has been heavy lately. The last few months, I mean, we are all had our, our COVID story. We all came through COVID and whether we agreed with restrictions or how the, our government, the provincial government or federal government or the world managed COVID, we, we have our, our journey that we, we went on. And um, I've been trying to share with people like the, the exhaustion that we, we entered post COVID in. Um, we, I think we were, we dismissed it. We, as a, society kind of were so eager to move on me included let's just put that in the rearview mirror and get back to the way things used to be or the new normal whatever the jargon is the this stuff interview i've done in person in a council chair or in a, a town hall since the pandemic so this tells well, you well i'm so happy to be number one. Oh, first, i yes. should say <laughs> no first yeah. municipal politician who i've sat down face yeah. to face on the show so well, but we were so quick to get back to this, and for good reason. Yeah. Hey, we all missed it, and there's all those reasons. But I think we, we quickly dismissed how we were actually entering this new normal, and that was just wiped out, bombarded. Um, mental health and all of these things, and, and I'm no 
um, expert in any of this, but uh, I mean, I know I was carrying a lot of fatigue and just the way we were having to meet and the issues we were having to deal with and the way people were treating, um, you know, I've, I've never been yelled at uh, from in a parking lot going to the bank before until COVID. Um, I, I was imagine this is not what you signed up for when you decided to get back into the political realm. No. Well, no one did, right? No, um, no one cho chose a global pandemic, obviously. But <laughs> um, the, the leaders that um, happened to be in, in those chairs and seats at the time um, were really, it's the a burden of leadership, really. Um, but we, hey, I think most of us took it. It's, you don't get to pick the hands that you're dealt and you deal with it and you move on. So here we are moving on, but we're still um, dealing with some of the wake of what COVID has left behind. And that is like people's uh, fuses are shorter. Um, their ability to, to speak and the platforms they have through social media are giving them uh, more voice than ever before. Um, people in leadership roles can choose to listen to them or not. Um, but then, like we talked before, getting the average citizen to speak up is challenging. So what is, what is the future? What, what is the right decision to make when we, we vote on things? And it's, it's crafting uh, or spending municipal dollars into the future that are we on the right track? You have to decide on many different issues on a regular basis. When you go into that council chamber, you yeah. have to decide what the best path forward is. And the decisions you make will be implemented within a few days, relatively yeah. the next day if a bylaw passes or a policy change, it's changed within the minutes. How much responsibility and weight do you put on yourself every time you walk into that council chambers to be informed but not be so cemented in your thinking without being able to be persuaded by different opinions, by residents, mm -hmm. by your fellow council members. Yeah, um, I take that very seriously. I, actually, I, it's something I talk with council about often is entering into council chambers with an open mind. I mean, you have to do your research, you read the admin reports and our agendas, uh, you talk to people on the street. I mean, we each have our networks. Yeah. And I, I, our council is uh, a great council. We're diverse. We're different ages, different uh, walks of life, and different backgrounds. And I think we really bring a, a good cross-section of our community to the table. Um, but we can't come with a pre-written speech of how you're going to uh, vote on something because I actually think the best decisions that, that get made are generally compromises of, of a of a platform that you came in on. And if we're open to debate and discussion, we generally come up with solutions to problems that none of us had thought about until we put our heads together. And those are the most unique and innovative uh, paths forward that uh, really see positive change in a community. Um, we're sitting in an example of that. This, uh, this entire municipal building, and you, this, I'm now segueing back to the question you asked earlier about what was an issue back then in the day. Well, in 2002 or three, this was a, the Western Heritage Center. It was a provincial museum for ranching history of, of Alberta. Oh, wow. it, uh, they, the province built it, the whole Cochrane Ranch site here, the 130 or so acres that we're, we're on, all provincial land, a historic site. And it went bankrupt and sat vacant for a few years. Um, the town at that time, we had our old council chambers in the basement and the town hall downtown with a fire hall attached to it. And we were looking for a new space. So the, it just happened to line up. The province said, would you consider taking this on for a dollar? A dollar. And that seems like a no-brainer right now. But... <laughs> Back then, Cochrane was a different community, smaller. This was the edge of town. We had a, a, a real rough road of convincing people that this was a good decision for our community, that we could move our council chambers here. It came with a theater. Um, a, a, there's a whole bunch of amenities here, and it was way too big for what we needed. So our plan was to lease out to a uh, different private enterprise in, in the interim until we could grow into it. Today, we're almost in the middle of Cochrane. Um, we're almost bursting at the seams, and we're, there's uh, no more leases that are being renewed as our municipal office space has taken over, um, and we've grown into this. Looking back, 
was it a, a tough decision? But I believe it was the right one. And it's, it's paid off for 20 some years. How, how important is it for yourself to sell the tough decisions? Because the tough decisions are never the ones that you think are gonna be the tough decisions. When I've no. sat down and <laughs> talked to mayors, Reeves, counselors from across Canada, they always tell me that the, the most weirdest issues are the ones that mostly get the public engagement. Uh, Okotoks was backyard chickens. I was they just going to say chickens. Gonna, <laughs> chickens was their big thing. Yeah. They didn't expect it. Uh, one was, the, uh, I know Clearwater County is going through their uh, municipal development plan right now. And that's a big issue, which they thought was not going to be a big thing. But misinformation has changed the way that yeah. it has. For you, the smaller uh issues may not seem like important ones but these are the ones that the residents may be attracted to and may want to talk about when you talk about a one dollar building that seems like a no-brainer mm -hmm. but why do we need it right so how mm -hmm. important is it for you to sell all decisions that council makes as mayor um yeah i don't look at it as selling okay. um well it's um there's that fine balance of we are elected to make decisions and then, so when should we uh, make that decision or when should we maybe increase our public engagement on that issue? Or, um, I mean, you could even go to a plebiscite. Um, I mean, there's different methods and, and tools that we could use. At the end of the day, I think, um, I mean, there's, there's hills to die on and then there's, uh, there's, there's decisions that aren't worth it. But um, it's, it's, I think it's, it's, again, around just, having a good finger on the pulse of the community, not being too personally tied to any one decision. Um, it's one of the things I love about the job. It's like I woke up today and this is my calendar and this is how I've charted my week. And I mean, an hour later, you could be going a completely different direction based on something that's happened in the community. So it's challenging, but it's also dynamic. And it's, it's what gets me out of bed every morning. So I just realized we're almost at 30 minutes and I've not even gone to segment two. So I want to turn <laughs> okay. to segment two right now. And before I ask this question, I preface it by saying this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. Mm -hmm. This is not a motion of council. This is not opinion of council. This yeah. is not a policy of council. This is your opinion. Um, but I'm assuming you speak for the town, but I'm going to say that it's your opinion okay. as well. In your opinion, what is the biggest issue today, as of recording this, facing the town of Cochrane? I think it's... issues? Uh, I, I'm not afraid of any issues that we have. We'll, we'll solve all of them. Um, we'll well, find solutions. The one that you deal with on a regular basis? The, it, it's going to be, it has to be public engagement. Right now, it is, it is council listening to social media comments and, um, <laughs> well, and, and, and having that influence decision making. I, I think there's this, again, my personal opinion, yeah. there is a place for social media. Yeah. It is one uh, place to get in information. It's not the place. So uh, I really believe our, our work cut out for us over the next year, maybe forever now, is going to be getting people engaged, um, and getting reaching that true cross-section of our community to have their voice heard in the decision-making process. This goes back to apathy, though. Unless something, unless the water doesn't turn on and the uh, garbage isn't picked up, people are happy with the way that government runs unless there's a big decision that's mm -hmm. going to affect them or if their taxes go up even a 0.1%. Yeah. <laughs> Getting engagement is a unique entity. Uh, yeah. I worked with one of your administration staff up in a northern municipality and I worked for their communications and marketing and I can tell you engagement is hard. Yeah. It's not something that even prior pandemic it was hard because... Mm -hmm. The, it's the polarization of the provincial and federal politics that is now going into the municipal governments and politics that we're seeing. What's the first step? And I know the hardest uh, path of a journey is the first step. So yep. for you, what does that first step look like in changing the way that people look at municipal government, look at municipal politics, but also engage on the issues that are important to the people of Cochrane. You highlighted it earlier. Um, government is slow. We can't be slow in this, this form anymore. No. We, we have to do things differently. We can't just have a town hall 
and put up a, a A-frame sign and call that public engagement. We're not doing that, and I'm not picking on anyone that is. It's just expecting people to come to us and having six people show up at an open house or a, Same six it's too. right. Um, we can't, we can't, we just cannot do those things like that anymore. We have to evolve. We actually have to get ahead of what's coming next. I mean, that, that's a big, that's a big deal. And that's a, it's a would, hard. Would a hundred people in town know what the issues are in front of council right now? Um, I'd like to think so. <laughs> I always say this. I, my gut test is if I could go downtown and, and gather 100 people from Cochrane on the street and tell them what we're up to, if I think that the, there would be generally in favor, okay, it's a good idea. <laughs> it's, it's getting the 100 people. So it may not even be um, something we've thought of yet. I, I want us to be innovative. Uh, think it, this is a total cliche, but think outside the box when it comes to getting people involved. And I'm not saying we need to hear from everyone all the time. That's our job as council. That's why we're elected is to, to be here all the time making decisions. But on the big things that are going to affect this community long term, um, we need to hear from people. Just a, a yay or a nay on kind of where we're headed. Um, a general, you know, yeah, you guys are doing well. Uh, would be nice every once in a while. But isn't that what elections are for? Trent, I already played devil's advocate here, but you got reelected, so they must be thinking you're doing a good job. I know you say only 40% turned out, but... Well, I'll, I'll, here, I'll throw one back at you. I was acclaimed. Oh. <laughs> uh, well, council, we had the entire same council get reelected, yeah. so you can draw from those conclusions yeah. as you will. But I, as personally, I was left with someone either doesn't want this job <laughs> because we just came out of COVID and everyone else was smarter than I was and didn't put their name forward. Or the optimistic side of me is, hey, Jeff's doing a great job. We don't need to change the mayor right now. So I flip-flop between moods on whether or not, uh, you know, I just didn't get challenged because I think this uh, job as not mine in particular, but a municipal politicians is becoming increasingly more difficult it's more in the press. You talked about going for uh, groceries and, and the challenges that brings. I can't walk out of my own door and shovel my sidewalk in the wintertime without, and it's generally positive. But if you don't shovel it, though. Yeah, I, I get <laughs> municipal enforcement comes by and makes me shovel it. It's, uh, but the, you're never not the mayor. Um, I, I was on uh, holiday two weeks ago. I needed a break. And I was in Mexico with my wife. And we never do this. We took a last-minute vacation. And I just said, you know what? I'm going for a run. I'm running down the beach in Mexico, and someone says, hi, Jeff. They got a Cochrane T-shirt on. And I'm right back into being the mayor again, right? And, hey, it was a, someone being friendly, and I, I actually appreciated it. But it was a quick reminder of I, I'm never not the mayor and it's, uh, there's a, it's, it can be heavy at times, but it also comes to the territory. I don't want people to think I'm complaining about it, but it can be a lot. So what's your grace then? What's the grace period of this? Because there must be a silver lining, because while you were mayor 24-7, there's issues that are going to be in front of you. There's issues that are facing the community. You, you, while you probably don't want to be mayor 24-7, you are. What's the silver lining in the role of being mayor of your community then? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I've been asking myself that a lot. Uh, I mean, and hey, it's last uh, time I spoke to a mayor in a in a community, he resigned about four weeks later. So <laughs> please don't let this happen. Yeah. And it was not on the record. So oh, let's 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 try and keep my record of having politicians stay in their job. After I this. I would like that record to <laughs> to stay intact. It's um, silver linings. I I I love people. I love Cochrane. I want, my parents live here. My sister lives here still with her family. Uh, my kids both live here and, and work here. Um, that is my dream. Um, when, you know, when my daughter went away to university in Victoria, my wife and I thought, okay, well, th this is it. She's, she's out of the nest. She's gone to Victoria. She's seeing the world. She, we're likely not to see her back in Cochrane. She applied for a job here in our community and moved back, chose to. That is the dream I, you know, I didn't even realize it until it had come true that that is something that I've been working for, is to create a community where kids and our kids want to come back to and, and see a future here. Um, 
that that gets me excited about being mayor of a community that that has those opportunities for people not just me and my family but everyone who lives here um, where uh, seniors can can age in place and and feel welcome and have all the amenities and 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 grow old here uh, that's what my plan is so really I'm kind of building the community that selfishly that I want but I think I have to believe that that is what the majority of Cochrane wants as well and charting that path is exciting for me it's I love that type of work planning um, building community um, looking around the world and seeing what other communities are doing well and maybe borrowing and bringing some of that here or charting some of these innovative ideas and and creating our own future that is um, unique and different than anywhere else in the world last question on this segment because i am cautious of time here you've you've been councillor twice mm -hmm. you've been mayor for two terms now in manitoba new brunswick ontario bc we have listeners from across canada and around the world we have a lot of new term first term mayors first term councillors what advice would you give them who are going into that first year and still trying to get their sea legs uh, working to make sure that they make their communities better as well, like you want to for Cochrane. What advice would you give to councillors, mayors, who are looking for some advice from someone who's been in the position for some time to make their job a lot easier? And what advice would you have wanted to have had back in 2001 when you first got elected that you wish you wouldn't know? Yeah, um, great question. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, no, it's a good one. I think don't ever take it for granted. This is uh, like it, it may not last. You may not be mayor or a councillor next term. Um, and slow down. Try not to do everything on day one. It's uh, another cliche I'll throw out here. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And you talked earlier about, you know, government moving slow, but there's a reason why government governments move slow. We people we're in charge of people's public funds uh, and making decisions that when we build a building like our transit hub here this year that we opened, like we're not going to build another transit hub in my life, maybe, but it's going to be 20, 30 years from now. Governments build things um, to last and um, not very often, especially in smaller communities. So take your time, get it right, and shoot for the stars. Um, and I think often it's been a complaint I've had of, of even our municipal workings here is that we, we often get sidetracked with, you know, oh, our pool's going to cost us $53 million, we need, and at the last minute we cut a million dollars out of the budget to, to look good for a few people, but now we have to live for 50 years with a pool that doesn't have enough seating. Um, and and just like we're going to have to live with that problem instead of and and in this our case it's just a real example our pool's paid for already we built it in 2017 so i mean was another million and i don't mean to be trite about a million dollars but i mean and you what's got the annual operating budget of Cochrane. oh we're we're a billion dollar corporation with assets right like so in the grand scheme of things a million dollars is not that much but it is but it's a it that million dollars may not have been a big deal in that one budget, but the impacts that the million dollars would have had on the users yeah. for the next 50 years is enormous. So don't cut things just for, for looks. So I want to turn to my last segment, and this is my fun one, because this okay. is the first time I can actually ask this question in a weird way. <laughs> As a tourist to your community yeah. now, what are some of the hidden gems that I need to see before I head back home? Our trail system. Uh, you've likely come in from Calgary. Yep. You've eclipsed the Cochrane Hill, and that is what sells every single resident. I don't know how many people have said to me, as soon as I came over that Cochrane Hill, I was I knew I was going to live here. You see the Rocky Mountains in the backdrop. You've got the blue ribbon of the Bow River in the valley, and just Cochrane just unfolds below you, and and it's it's breathtaking. And I'm so uh, grateful to to live here in, in this community in this setting. Um, but our trail system, we've got kilometers of trail systems that we've, we've done. We, uh, councils of the past, administrations of the past, have done an excellent job stewarding our creeks and our river valley and our, our views and vistas from 
the hillsides in the valley to allow them to be enjoyable for everyone. You don't just, um, traditionally you'd see houses built right up to the edge of the hill and now it's the million dollar view and no one else can see it. We actually have policy where those houses are 15 meters back and we have a trail along the edge of the hills. So everyone has the opportunity to ride, um, walk, push a carriage, um, whatever your means of transportation, scooters now, um, go and enjoy our, our riparian areas and the beauty that we have here in just our natural setting. That That is one of those things that, and we're actively trying to improve that all the time. We're working with the Rotary Club right now to connect the Great Trail from Calgary to Cochrane through the Glenbow Ranch. So we'll have, um, yeah, I mean, and then eventually phase two is to connect to the Legacy Trail in Canmore. So um, there, there's, there's a, a hidden gem right there. So before I came out here, I posted on social media, what are some of the tourist spots? Because I wanted to know from, and two councillors from two different communities told me about this coffee shop. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> so while I'm not supposed to, I'm, while I'm not trying to give you a shameless plug here, but yeah. where is this coffee shop and uh, where can I get a good latte? In town? <laughs> well, I, I try not to mix um, business and politics, okay. um, but you asked the question. Yep. So uh, Cochrane Coffee Traders is uh, my family business. Um, my, my wife and I bought it in 2002. We raised our family there. My son still works there, um, but both my kids were baristas and, and worked in, in the, the business. And uh, I've heard ice cream is popular in yeah. town as well. We are just around the corner from McKay's Ice Cream. McKay's has been a, a, I think they're celebrating their 75th anniversary this year. Um, fan, same family owns it still. Um, it's a unique kind of small town experience to walk down our main street, historic main street. I just did it. Yeah, and walk in and get an ice cream in the same place that you could have 75 years ago. Um, around the corner is where my shop is. Um, I think, again, I try not to promote it in, in the political forum, but oh, it does I, I give me... I opened up the question. No, you so. did, but it, it, um, it as a, I mean, take the name away from it. It is where I actually go to, to interact with people. I can just spend an hour out front and random, uh, everyday Cochrane residents, tourists are, are there. Yesterday, for example, I ran into three ladies that were out walking, uh, one from Cochrane, two from um, Diamond Valley now it's called, yep. um, that were, they're just a walking club and they were walking the trails of Cochrane. And they just happened to be there and they shared the, you know, their experience. And I, I, that's where I go for honest, open feedback from people. So two last questions. First one, your, the Cochrane motto is how the West is now. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> it's, uh, I wasn't involved in the slogan. <laughs> but, but you're I, the mayor and you yeah, have to sell. <laughs> it, no, I, 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 there was, um, we, we hosted the Mid-Size City Mayor's Caucus yeah. here uh, last month. Um, I had some comments from a few of the mayors like that. That is excellent. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? It, it works for us because it's a play on the, how the West is now, right? Uh, or how the West was one, yeah. uh, a twist on that. But so it's a bit of a, a, a throwback to our, our roots. And we're really trying very, very hard in Cochrane to preserve what our identity is. And that is that small town feel. I get a lot of pushback on, we're not a small town anymore. Well, we're not. But it still has the feeling of uh, connected, uh, caring, uh, friendly, small town vibe. Uh, whether you're going for ice cream or just walking downtown or um, getting your groceries, there's still that, that feeling here. Um, and actually our tourism um, board has, has launched the, the, it's a feeling, Cochrane, it's a feeling. Because no one can really put their finger on it, but it's a feeling. And that it's, it's accurate. So that's really, I think, encapsulates that. So the last question, and this is the million dollar question. Okay. This is the one that you can take as long as you want to answer, as short as time. You can short. edit out the, uh, the pause. Yep. <laughs> In your opinion, what makes Cochrane such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? I can, I can answer that quickly. Location, location, location. We are um, a sh stone's throw from the city of Calgary. Your access to an international airport 40 minutes. You want to go anywhere in the world, but you're not right next to the airport. Um, we have all the amenities of a big city at our doorstep, but not the big city. 
And then likewise, looking west, we're the gateway to the Rockies, um, but we're not in the Rockies. So those mountain towns are have a different look and feel and, and expense to them. That, uh, and Cochrane is, is somewhere in the middle of that. And the location, I, I've talked about the coming down the Cochrane Hill, the iconic Cochrane Hill, and seeing everything unfold below you. I mean, we live in the most stunning backdrop, uh, natural area in, in all of, well, I mean, it rivals many other areas in the world. And I would say that, and then um, young families are flocking here to raise their kids. It's a, it's just, it's, we have the best of, of everything right here. And the secret's out. I mean, we're, it, from when I moved here, 1,200 people to 35,000 today, we're, and the trajectory is, is only up, so. Thank you so much to our guests for joining us for this episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share their stories with you. If you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high quality content. Every little bit helps. We appreciate your support as well. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes. And if you can, please don't forget to subscribe to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more behind-the-scenes content, show updates, and so much more. And finally, as much as we all love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real-life, in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Cross Border Interviews. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.